If you could have a coach help you identify and focus on what's important, would that accelerate your success? If you answered yes, then this podcast is for you. Each week, my guests, professional coaches, will share one actionable piece of advice to help you level up wherever you need it most. My name is Chris Ippolito, and welcome to the Get Coached Podcast. Hey, Alan. Hey. <laughs> Thanks for uh, for being my first guest on the Get Coached Podcast. It is an honor. Thanks very much, Chris. Yeah, it, um, we've known each other for a little while, and how we connected was actually, I like our, our story as far as how we connected, because it's, it's a lot about the technology and, uh, and, and just leveraging technology in a positive way. But I want you to share that story, if you don't mind, how we ended up connecting. Yeah, absolutely. So, um, you know, I think we, we connected primarily on, on LinkedIn and, you know, had conversations, if I'm not mistaken, originally around some of the ideas to do with, uh, you know, with marketing and some of the trends and at least from my perspective where I think some of that will go and the influence technology has on obviously, um, the, the, I guess the technology that we're using and then of course our own well being. Uh, which is sort of more so my my area of focus, and uh, yeah, I felt like I, I learned a lot from you in terms of um, you know your your perspective on you know what some of the the best practices in marketing right now are, and I, I felt like hopefully I was able to share some ideas as well around um, where I think the trend will ultimately go and how we can position ourselves now as business owners of the like to uh, be in the best spot from a brand. Um, perspective in in the coming years yeah yeah we it was actually originally we connected on shaper but then we moved the conversation quickly over to linkedin because that's obviously right we're like oh yeah there's a good connection here and then we jumped on a yeah. call and and yeah we had that really very cool conversation about technology and you really like opened up my eyes around that because as much as i uh, I kind of knew what you were talking about, but I hadn't really thought about it from the perspective that you were sharing with me. So I was wondering if you'd, you'd be willing to kind of like, let's revisit that conversation. Cause I thought you had a great love perspective to. on it. Thank you. Uh, yeah. I'd love to, to revisit the conversation. Where do you want to start? Um, so you had mentioned one of the biggest takeaways uh, I think from that conversation I took was the direction that that marketing and technology is going is around attention and, and, yeah. and, and you'd mentioned the term of attention economy. Um, yes. So I'll, I'll kind of let you take it from there if, if that's sure. good. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. So, uh, so the attention economy, just as a, a matter of def defining it before we kind of go into what it means for us, you know, different aspects of our lives. It's a modern trend that is occurring because we now have orders of magnitude more content than we could ever consume in a lifetime. This is specific to digital content, obviously. There's a variety of other yeah, uh, content, what we're doing things right to consume in life. Right? <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, and it has really emerged because now content creation has been democratized. Technology has allowed us all to you know, pick up a phone, capture a selfie, capture a video, easily post it. And so what that does is it now makes attention uh, the scarce resource as opposed to the content, which might've been the case 50, 60 years ago, let's say when TV was first invented or there were a handful of radio shows, that type of thing. Um, so there are two big risks, uh, I guess, around that. So first of all, um, attention is extremely valuable as well because we all trade on it. We have to have someone's attention before we can sell them anything. We have to have their attention before we can work with them or collaborate with them on anything. Um, in most cases, we need to have their attention to even give them something. So attention is an extremely valuable resource and just economics 101, anything that is scarce and valuable gets extremely expensive. Mm -hmm. And so um, from a digital marketing uh, standpoint and online ads and that type of thing, um, those are going to be at very, very, very expensive as uh, everyone realizes that that's where attention is and everyone realizes that they're trading on uh, this attention um, and you get a lot of people effectively bidding for a, um, a resource that is in uh, finite and short supply, relatively yeah. speaking. So it causes two main issues. Um, and I think we're starting to see both of these uh, emerge. And um, 
my goal is to really turn <laughs> is around resolving them. But the first issue is more so for medium to, to small size businesses, right? So because we all trade on attention, you know, I could be a shoe salesperson and I'm now competing with Coca-Cola, not because I sell soft drinks, but because I also trade on attention. I need your attention to sell my shoes, even if I have the best shoes in the city or even the best shoes in the country. Um, if I don't have your attention, you won't buy from me, right? And similarly with, um, I guess the issue with that then becomes that as attention gets extremely expensive to purchase, which is effectively online ads and marketing, um, the, how do I best put this? The companies with the deepest marketing budgets are the ones that are going to be able to buy more of that attention, right? So those tend to be the larger firms and that can mean that the small to medium sized businesses will struggle to stay ahead or to get ahead, struggle to start up in many cases, simply because they won't have enough traction uh, and they won't be able to buy enough attention to even launch, if that makes sense, to get enough you know, uh, of a start um, to start paying down obviously some of their operating costs and, and pay back their, their, fine or their fixed costs too. So um, <clears throat> what I think the, the concern there is, is that that's going to start, um, I guess the market is going to start uh, combining it. We're going to, have, going to have more oligopolies, um, more large firms as opposed to fewer, and that, that reduces the amount of choice that we have as consumers, which is, from an economics perspective, um, generally a bad thing. Mm. The other piece that I'm, I'm concerned about, and obviously this affects every business owner who's listening to this, right? That you know this this is an existential threat to you know where your business is at if you don't have enough attention and if you can't. Um, acquire attention in the coming years in a cost-effective way outside of, of online marketing, which will become increasingly less financially viable. So the other big issue though, uh, which is one that I care even more deeply about, is that because attention is so valuable, increasingly more addictive and effective means will be used to get and keep our attention. And I think we've begun to see that in a, in a lot of respects. And there's nothing wrong right now with anything, um, any form of entertainment or the like that, or any social platform that has our attention. It's, it only becomes an issue when we reflect back on how we've spent that time and we regret it, right? Um, it, it's when we regret how we spend our time that these methods or technologies and the like start becoming a problem. And so my, my concern around that is that, you know, the more that different technologies, let's call it hack our attention or, or learn what keeps our attention, um, the more we're going to be engaged necessarily on that and the less that we will be focusing time on that which we truly value or that which we is valuable for us long term mm. uh, or that we that we find fulfilling as a way to, to spend our life which i argue is is our end game um, and so i think i see to, at the attention economy as a major driver of regret uh, which is um, this this form of suffering that we all have but it is actually 100 percent preventable and the problem i'm solving um, but I'm, I'm just concerned that it's going to get far worse before it gets any better. And I'm hoping to share some ideas that will help entrepreneurs and, and business owners start the work today that will allow them to thrive in the attention economy through yeah. different means. And, and as well, you know, open the eyes of the, the average consumer as well. Uh, we are all obviously consumers too, uh, to give us the, I guess, the tools to define what it is that we value, to weight what it is that we value, so that we have such conviction around who we are and what we want and why we're doing it, that in the short term, that supersedes anything that might tempt us. Right. Yeah, for you, it's been, it's, it's solving the problem of regret. Um, would, you, would you say that it also expands to some of the other uh, I guess almost what people are calling epidemics of mental illness, of anxiety, of stress, of depression, and all that. It, do you feel like it's all tied together? It is. I think, let's put it this way. Uh, we can go into the specifics as far as an actionable process is concerned later, if you like, but imagine that it were possible and that you did know yourself so well and that you felt like you had given yourself permission to pursue who you were and what you wanted and you knew why you were doing it. It does a variety of things. First of all, it, it reduces the number of existential questions you'll be asking yourself because you will have thoughtfully gone through it and, and found you some of your answers. And it may shift or evolve with time, but uh, nevertheless, you'll, you'll have a high degree of self-awareness, which is just not something I think a lot of people 
have. It's not something we're we're brought up, I think, um, being taught or shown. Yeah, we're definitely and, taught that. Yeah. So, so it does a variety of things. First of all, I think it, it helps uh, minimize the amount of regret because you're able to make more regret proof decisions that are in line with what it is that you value in life uh, and spend your time in a way that is balanced according to what the, the different combinations of things that you find valuable in your life. But, you know, around that too, um, you know, the anxiety and the depression, I mean, a lot of that comes from, you know, comparing ourselves to others. It comes from, you know, feelings of inadequacy. It comes from, uh, feelings of resentment in some ways, you know, with loved ones who told us what would they thought we should do in our lives, and we went and we've done it, but we're not yeah. happy. Um, and so I think the better we know ourselves, the more we realize that success from someone else is not what success for us means or is, and it allows us to be happy when we see other people succeed by their own um, definitions, and realize that we're on our own path. And that that is what success is to us. Uh, and really it's the, that the pursuit of it uh, rather than the achievement of it. And we can kind of get into exactly why later. But um, yeah, I, I think it is all tied together. But the more you know yourself uh, in a structured and actionable way, um, and the, I think the more confident you are with your actions, your decisions, and you realize what is and is not relevant when you see it. So you're better able to apply that filter. Right. So what would be like when you're working with your clients, what, what are some of the, the action items or the, the guidance that you provide that help them uh, get life back on track so that yep. they are, are, are living a life of fewer to no regrets? Correct. Yep, absolutely. So let's just uh, quickly do a quick definition and then I'll take you through the exact process I tend to Perfect. take people through yeah. in, in, a, in my free consultations and uh, people can apply 80 to 90% of this themselves. It does help to have someone who's done it a bunch before guide you through just tweaking it a little bit, but this is something your, your listeners can take away right away. So when I talk about regret, I'm talking about making actions and decisions that are not in line with what you value. And uh, the opposite is fulfillment. Fulfillment is pursuing uh, that which you value and making decisions in line with what you value. So the question comes up, well, what do you value? Right now, most of us, when asked that question, don't have an answer ready. And uh, that, that's fair, right? So first of all, don't feel bad if you don't, if you don't have an answer for that ready. Um, but if you have no clue where to start, first of all, here's one way you can get started. If you reflect back on the number of um, maybe the several dozen types of experiences that you've had in your life so far, maybe different relationships, different uh, extracurriculars, maybe different forms of education, maybe different um, types of travel you've done or different places you've gone. Uh, if you list what you enjoyed and did not enjoy about each of those activities, and you know, it takes a little while to do this, right? But it's worth it. Um, and you start looking at the trends of, well, what have I enjoyed that seems to pop up? What aspects of these different experiences have I enjoyed that pops up in multiple of these experiences? That is usually a very good start to help you decide what it is that you value in life. Now, I, want, I do want to make a quick distinction. Uh, people talk about personal values and they talk about corporate values, and those are similar in the sense that they tend to reflect character traits, right? Whether that's honesty or resilience, that type of thing. And those are, those are important. Um, I mean something a little bit broader than that because uh, those personal values sort of fit into this larger view of what do you value. So when I say what do you value, the idea is what aspects of life do you value? Do you value particular relationships? Do you value personal growth, professional growth? Um, health, whether that's physical, psychological, um, mental, right, um, mm -hmm. spiritual. Do you um, do you value alone time? Do you value entertainment? That kind of thing. So there are an infinite number of categories there that you can choose from, and uh, you can choose any which ones you want. You and only you get to decide what you value. <laughs> um, other people can suggest things, but um, you know, I, I, it's it's something I really do hope that people take away. Now from a, a personal value standpoint, if people are curious, that tends to fit into either a personal growth uh, segment, right? I want to become more like that. Right? I value these, these personal traits. And so or the, these, uh, yeah, these traits. So I, I want to become more like that, or it shows up in a social or networking sense. I want to meet more people like that. And so that's how you can sort of um, act in a way that is uh, consistent with your personal values or those corporate values that people tend to talk about most. But, it's far more actionable to think about the aspects or the behaviors in life that you, that are intrinsically motivating that you just enjoy um, because you can actually, 
do something about those, right? You can value honesty, but it's rare that you can just choose to go do honesty. You know, it's more of a, a way of being. Um, right. And I find that's a little less actionable. So can I ask a quick question? So it sounded yep. like one, one of the things you had mentioned was perhaps for personal growth is that like desire to want to surround yourself with um, people of that, that quality, that character quality that you're looking yep. for. Absolutely. The, the reason that one really stuck out for me is that, to be honest, that's a big part of the reason why I'm doing this is, is coaches and uh, th- that, that group of people that are pursuing that type of career usually have a certain kind of mindset that I've always been uh, very attracted to, but didn't really realize what it was until a few years back. Um, right. and, and the question I was asking myself was, how can I uh, get more time with, with that type of person. And this is basically the, the, the results of that. So that, that's why that one really just stuck out at me. I wanted to confirm that's what I heard, but that's awesome. Cool. So, Hey, I'm um, doing it. (laughs) (laughs) You are. And and, you know, it works out nicely, right? Because it's a win, 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 right? Uh, Ideally with the right fit. Um, it's beneficial for all of us to get together, right. To, to consider these questions in our own lives and, and the perspectives of others. Right. Yeah. So, um, so getting back to, to what it is that you value when you have a list of three or four or five or six things, these are really your top, call them your top five, even though the number that you, you consider your top um, can, uh, can change. Uh, it's not that you don't value any, anything or everything else in life too. You do. It's just that these top five are really disproportionately more uh, intrinsically motivating to you. So when you have this list of, of five, the question then becomes, well, how much do I care about each, right? Because you might have several options in your life when you're making a particular decision and some of, your, some of the aspects of life you value suggest you take one option and some of the other aspects of life you value suggest you take the other option. How do you break a tie, right? And this is, I think, the age-old question that I just had not seen a good answer to yet because what you value and what, so it's intrinsically motivating, these are subjective feelings, right? And uh, we'll go back into this uh, perhaps a little bit later, but the, you know, my, my business's name is Sentient Future Consulting. And it's this idea that we're in- inherently sentient, that we uh, evaluate life subjectively. Uh, and it's important that, that we look at it that, that way first. So, but it's hard to, to make the subjective or the qualitative more actionable or quantitative, but there is a way. So the way kind of works like this. So imagine a standard week, 168 hours. If you subtract off eight hours, uh, a day for sleep, roughly you get 112 hours. To make the math easy, think about 100 waking hours in a week. Assuming you had no other responsibilities and you could only spend your time on one of those five aspects of life that you valued at a time, how much time would you spend on each of those things you value? Mm-hmm. Okay. Right? Um, now, it's a strange question because we don't hear it asked very much, but it's actually a very answerable one because it's something we already do. We have time. We do choose to spend it. A lot of it is conscious. A lot of it we choose to spend unconsciously, or rather we subconsciously choose how to, how we spend it. Yeah. And the idea is really to be a bit more conscious about how we spend it and plan it and put ourselves in sort of the right situation. But when you answer that question, and even though it's asking you for a number, it is a subjective question. It is a qualitative question. Um, it's what balance feels right to you. And when you have 100 hours, you are faced with the reality that it's finite. You're faced with the reality that when you choose to spend your time in one way, you are by definition choosing to not spend your time in other ways. And that's okay because what you find is the balance for you because we all have the same time in, in a week or in a day as it were. Um, you know, when you find the right balance for you, then you're, you're good right? Uh, You wouldn't, you wouldn't, you wouldn't make any changes. So it's something that is really worthwhile thinking. Now, when you've done that, what you've effectively done is you've transformed your list of top five subjective or qualitative values, right? Things that you value in life that are intrinsically motivated and you transform them into decision criteria and you can use it in two ways. The first way is to make medium to large decisions and I, I look at it this like this. If you're maybe making a career choice or where you're going to live in terms of a city or you know other large life choices, maybe education. Um, if you list out the options you are you think are viable or have promise at the time, and um, you know down the down the side you list your values right with the relative weights. You can score for each of your options out of ten 
how well they rank on each of the, the aspects of life you value, right? Uh, how, if I choose this career, how much time am I going to have for exercise? Or uh, how much time am I going to have to socialize? Is it intrinsically social, my work, plus having some time outside of work? That type of thing. Mm-hmm. So you, you score them out of 10. And then for each option, you multiply the scores times the weights. You add those okay. up in some, somewhat of a sum product way, and you get a, an answer at the bottom of every option. That number, it doesn't have units. It doesn't really matter what the units are. But the, high, the option with the highest number is the option that suits your values best, that matches your values best. Uh, it's the option that you are likely to feel most fulfilled choosing. And it is regret-proof in the sense that you would never come back to this point in time with the options you knew at the time, with the values you had at the time, and with the information you had at the time, and choose anything differently. It is, it's regret-proof. Um, it's not to say the outcome is necessarily favorable. We don't control that. But the quality of the decision is distinct from the outcome, which we can talk about a little bit later. And when you do it that way, a couple of neat things happen. First of all, even if it's the exact same decision that you might have int- intuitively chosen, you now know exactly why you chose it. And so you can have peace around that decision. You don't look back and have these what-if questions because you realized you went through this in a process that was in line with what you you at the time, what you valued at the time, and what you uh, and the options at the time. Uh, and the other neat thing about it is, um, I guess, the how how you use it in in the second way, right? And that is comparing how it is you spend your time now to how it is you would ideally spend your time, right? And that gives you a good idea of what to work on, frankly. If you realize that you value spending time with family more than you do, or value spending, or yeah, more than you, you actually do, uh, and, or spending time exercising more than you actually do, and as a consequence, you actually value these other things less, it's you giving yourself permission to go do that, to strike that right balance for yourself, right? Uh, and I mean, the thing I would really advocate people try most is that when you've established what it is that you value, the big first thing is try not to ignore any one of those five or six or three elements for too long. That's when you really start to not feel yourself. Start there and then uh, try to hover around that balance uh, on a rolling average basis. Any given week is probably not going to you know, be exactly it and you certainly won't be able to sustain that exact balance um, week in, week out. But the closer you hover to it, the happier you're going to be. And that that fulfillment, that process of pursuing what it is you care about in a social arena, in a professional arena, in a growth arena, in a health arena, whatever arenas matter to you, that's the end game. That's the goal. Everything else is a means to that, to those ends. Right. I think it might help to almost walk through it in, in, as an example. So, sure. um, just, just because I remember like, when you first shared this with me, my head was spinning and I can only imagine that some of the other people listening might go like, holy moly, like that's, that sounds very complicated. Um, but I think if maybe we walk through it together, just as like very surface level, just to give it a little bit more um, visibility as far as what that might look like. So you were yep. saying that the exercise being somebody sits down, they list out the things that uh, are important to them, but, uh, and, and not necessarily that it has to be five, but we'll, maybe we'll use three or five as an example, but right. things like health being, being, uh, in that top five category, I, I would sure. assume is probably quite popular. Would you yep. say that it would have to be more specific as far as like, what if, cause for me, health is important. So would, if yeah, you're coaching I, I, I tend to, that, would I, would you say like, what about I, I tend to advocate is- that we get a, a little bit more specific. So from health, I, I tend to focus either on, uh, you know, physical wellness, okay. mental wellness, Perfect. and spiritual wellness, uh, wellness. And the specific behaviors within that are obviously up to the individual, right? Yeah. And they don't have to choose all three. Some people don't value physical wellness in like their, in their the, the grand scheme of things. They're 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 happy not being athletic, right? right? But they're in a good they're in a good headspace or good spiritually, whatever the case might be. And like, okay. no judgment. Like, people get to choose whatever they want. Okay, but, that um, helps. Sure. I think that helps. Yeah. So health health 
would be too broad. So if you, you, when you're coaching somebody and they, they were to share health, you would say, okay, which, what kind, what, what kind, right? Physical, yep. mental, or emotional. Um, yep. So that's perfect. Then yep. what about from a, relationships? Yeah, from a, relationships. Yeah. I, I, I tend to broad? suggest mm, a little bit. Um, so it, it's perfectly fine. Like, let's put it this way. If you want the category, if it fits nicely as you know, a combined category for you, do it, right? Um, there, there's no right and wrong here. There are reasons why you might choose either a combined or something more, more detailed. Uh, obviously, the reason why you, might want, might, why you might want to go more detailed is maybe within that there are two halves of it, but you actually disproportionately value one versus the other and you want to reflect that. And it helps you plan your time in a way that gives that part more and more emphasis. Um, so from a, from a, a relationship standpoint, the three that tend to come up, um, if you're going to split them up, would be family. Yeah. So this would be like blood relatives, yeah. um, friends, and significant others. Oh, okay. So significant right? others would actually... Yeah. Whether that's a boyfriend, a girlfriend, a spouse. husband, wife, yeah. spouse, you know, a okay. fiance. Um, so those tend to be good too because what I find is that people will will tend to value different different people in their life to different degrees yeah. and so it's important to be clear with yourself as to you know and, and unapologetic too it's like this person just matters more to me than some mm-hmm. of these other people mm-hmm. and and that's okay because i only have finite you know resources here um i have to make a choice and i don't want to make i don't want to set them all equal just because it's that's what's perceived to be fair from somebody else's perspective if it isn't intrinsically what I want. Like you have to unapologetically pick what you want. And when you do that, actually you find you, you, you serve other people best. Yeah. Um, so, so I'd recommend sort of breaking that out. And one other uh, helpful distinction actually is to think about what types of things, they're very few, but what types of things should not be on the list mm-hmm. at all for what it is that you value. As far the as first like one, things you don't invest time in. Um, so yeah, I mean, being conscious of what isn't on your list is, is useful, but what I, what I mean is, you know, I've I've given pretty much everybody carte blanche as to what, what it is that they put on there, but there are a couple of things that I argue shouldn't ever be on anyone's list. Oh, okay. Okay. Um, I think I get what you're saying now. Can you give some examples? Um, Yep. So the first is money. Oh, really? Okay. The second is time and the third is freedom, which is uh, kind of a combination Mm. of the two. But yeah. those are common ones that people say, oh, I value money. I value, well, if you think about it, time, money, and freedom are effectively all either resources or opportunity, right? And they aren't inherently valuable or enjoyable to you. It's what you spend them on that is valuable or enjoyable to you. So I want you to think about that question more deeply. If you had more money, how would you spend it? Right. If you had more time, how would you more spend it? If you were free from some shackle if you want to think of it that way (laughs) uh you know um what would you do right it's those that are intrinsically motivating um it's the ends that are intrinsically motivating and not the means um so and what that then uh, what that then does is if you value i guess if you value having lots of creature comforts right then money will necessarily be a part of um or let's put it this way, when you look at your options, right, and you, um, you know, and, and one of them scores, sorry, you look at your options and one of the options happens to help, you know, earn you more money, right, it's going to naturally score higher on that creature comforts um, list item, right? So it, it sort of intrinsically does that as opposed to um, money for the sake of money, obviously time and for the sake of time, freedom for the sake of freedom. Um, those who have money or time or freedom and don't know what to do with them, like that can be equally depressing. And it's, it's what you see with a lot of celebrities as well. Right. right. So it's, it's the reason you're excluding those is because, um, not, let's say, not some, deep enough. yeah, let's say as an example that, uh, physical health is one of the f- top five and sure. you're, you're going through your decision process and you're making the decision around, um, a job opportunity. I think that one's just relevant or a business opportunity actually, because we're going to be talking 
our audience yep. is mostly entrepreneurs. So they're wondering like, yep. should I pursue this? And then as they're going through their decision-making process, if, if, if it's something that is going to allow them more of an opportunity to take care of their physical health, which could be right. either more time, more money to invest in personal trainers, a, a fitness yep. coach, a health coach, whatever it is, mm-hmm. then they're just that they're naturally just going to score that higher. Correct. Okay. Yeah. Um, so it, you can, you can recognize that opportunity as having, as giving you more of the means towards those ends, yeah. but your list should be your ends. Got it. Right. Uh, start with um, the end in mind. Start with, start the, with the end in mind. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <Simon> Sinek says. <laughs> uh, so, and, and, and a lot, frankly, uh, he has, has driven a lot of, of my thinking, I guess, in, in that space and I've developed my own why and the like, and I encourage everybody else to think about theirs as well. Um, the last thing, I guess, around that topic that uh, I'd like to add, I um, just want to make sure I get it right here. escaping me sorry i'll I'll probably come back to it but um yeah it's it's just incredibly important to to find that balance for you and unapologetically pursue it it's when you're going to be at your happiest it's when you're going to be able to serve other people best it's when you're Mm -hmm. going to serve the right people right um according to what it's value oh yeah i remember now um so for me personally like i've listed the aspects of life as more so the people in my life it's like who am I doing any of this for? Right. And that's another perspective people can take. So um, self should be in there somewhere because to sustainably serve anyone else, you need to take care of yourself. Um, You know, significant other is is there. My wife is in there. My kids are in there uh, at different rates actually. Um, And it helps govern for me how much time I choose to spend with each. Right. Um, And my extended family is in there. The general population is in there too. I, I, I call it earth, right? How much time am I devoting my life to serving people that I don't even know just because I care, just because it's all in our best interest. Um, you know, that's so, so people might appreciate that perspective as well. If you, if you don't want to think of things or activities or behaviors specifically, you can think about around who do you care about in your life? And then as you look at options you know, how well do those options allow you to um, serve your own needs, serve other people's needs. And um, I think that's a, that's a, another great way to be clear with your priorities. Yeah. That's awesome. I think I, I every time I, I hear you talk about it, cause I've, I've, the first time we talked, um, you sent me a video when you were presenting to um, a group of post-secondary students. I think it was engineering students, if I remember correctly. Yeah. yeah. Um, and you're going through the concepts and explaining it. It's just like, I'm like, this is so unique. I've never, ever heard. There's, there's little bits of it that, oh, that sounds kind of like this. Or uh, maybe I can, I can almost feel like I see where some of the influence has been drawn from. And, but mm-hmm. you've just put it all together into something incredibly unique and and i think could really speak to somebody who is is very much on more on that like analytical mind which with your background of being an engineer it's kind of it doesn't really surprise me that you ended up developing an approach like this it's 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 my default for sure um but you know it it can equally apply for people who like to operate more so on on principle as opposed to you know in the details so uh, the main idea is that that we're living intentionally, that we're clear on what it is that we value, and that we're we're in line with that. Um, and that's just what helps us lead our best lives. And everything else is really a mean to those ends. Yeah. And if you do that, if you serve others, which is um, simultaneously actually in your long term best interest, um, you know we are all better off long term, so are future generations. Right. So question, what are, from your experience in, in the people you've helped, worked, and even personal journey, what are some of the more common false beliefs that people have when it comes to making significant change in their life? Like in, in what you're, you're teaching and coaching, is, it's about living a regret-free life. And, yep. and when you deliver that message to somebody and you explain you know, the system and the process in which you do it, um, has there been some common... Uh, uh, feedback uh, where you've heard like and they're like oh I can't do this because insert 
really lame reason, to be honest, because yeah. it's always overcomable. Um, sure. What are some of the more common ones you've heard? I think a big one that comes up is that other people's opinions of what you should do with your life carry any weight at all. Um, and I'm not saying that we don't listen. Of course we listen. Of course we empathize. Of course we understand where they're coming from. But if we accept uh, the, um, the direction or the suggestions that other people have, it's because we've realized the, the wisdom or not, right? <laughs> but let's say we've realized the wisdom in that advice and we've taken it on as a matter of a conscious choice for ourselves because it is the right fit as opposed to just because somebody else said we should and we respect them. Uh, it has to feel intrinsically right to us. And so this this false belief that um, success is anything other than what you personally define it as. Uh, I, I think that uh, that gets in a lot of people's way um, just yeah. because even, even if you achieve it, first of all, a lot of success um, by traditional means, or I guess the traditional definition of it is uh, it is not fully under your control, right? So there's a lot of uh, third party influence. There's a lot of external factors. So first of all, nothing, none, nothing of that sort is guaranteed, but even if you do achieve it, if it doesn't set you on fire, if, if, if you don't inherently enjoy it, A, it's going to be a lousy victory or an, a hollow victory if you want to think of it that way. And B, you're not likely to get there if you don't intrinsically care about it because most things of significance take a lot of work. And we are just, humanity is not good at putting in a lot of work on things that we don't intrinsically care about. Right. Yeah. It's hard to I sustainably think, force ourselves to do something. That's a good one. Uh, just basically like not living your life on other people's terms kind of thing and or caring what they think or feel about the decisions you're making with your own life because at the end yeah. of the day uh it's really funny that we think that way because it's oh i can't do this because so and so might be disappointed unhappy not not like it but then we are at the same time caught in this this trap of of seeking a, uh, approval from other people because of yep. the way that a lot of social media operates with likes and reshares and and just the the vanity metrics of it which i know is is a big part of what you talked about and what well, we've talked about before we just mm -hmm. didn't get into the specifics today but yeah it's that's a i think that's a tough one for a lot of people to overcome just because that has been the 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 programming that we have gone through for the last right. i don't know 10 10 15 years or so with with the internet yep. and more recently with social media and all that kind of stuff which is part of the reason that people feel anyways that instagram and all those guys are trying to remove the likes and the numbers though mm -hmm. i heard a really per good perspective as to why they're actually getting rid of that but um it, it's it's one of the reasons perhaps we'll say yeah uh i i think so too and when i guess the funny perspective i have around that too is is this even if you really want to be wealthy let's say that's intrinsically motivating to you um because of the creature comforts or you love buying fancy things the newest gadgets whatever the case might be uh, living in a nice home if you don't choose a way to go about it that you, that intrinsically motivates you, right? If you are, if you aren't in love with that process, you won't get there. So, well, I guess what what I'm saying here is, you don't have, I guess, to live on somebody else's terms or to to pursue success by somebody else's definition is ironically less likely to get you there you're more likely to 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 fit somebody else's um you know version of success let's say from a financial standpoint if you do it your own way right right which i think one of the common almost stereotypical paths that we could probably illustrate as an example is the family of doctors who wants their children to become doctors because that's what the family does we become doctors yeah. that's how mm -hmm. we become successful then the child yeah. goes um, but I want to, I don't know, be an esports professional. Sure. Right. And, and their parents are like, no, that's go get a real job, right? Go be a doctor. Yeah. That's what you're supposed to do. Um, but what, and, and, 
and when and you hear this story all the time then they succumb to the 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 pressure of the parents they push through they do it and at some point in their life they end up saying like i've just never enjoyed any of this whether they had the financial results or not and yeah and that's that's exactly what you're trying to help people with is not to go down that path especially too far because then you've 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 exhausted that one resource that we all have a very finite amount of of time in life to do what made somebody else happy for sure and if anybody's listening to this needs some support or encouragement to pursue what it is that that they want and that they need help um giving themselves that permission then uh, you know please do reach out and we'll talk about how later but uh you know it's 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 incredibly important yeah actually you know what i think we've i i think that we this is a good place to kind of wrap up why don't you share uh where can people connect with you if they want to learn more about uh sentient future and what you're doing sure so uh, on just about every social platform uh you can find me under the name Sentient Future, so S E N T I E N T, and Future. Uh, so that's you know Instagram, Facebook, you name it. Um, I have my, my own podcast as well, and uh, the intent around any of that is that I'm you know, trying to create content that is innately valuable to you, that saves you time, and it's worth more time to you than the time it takes to you to consume it. So it's net positive. That's really the goal, um, and. Um, yeah, beyond, beyond that, uh, you know, there's email addresses and, and my website um, gives you a little bit more information with different links and that's uh, sentientfuture.earth. Uh, if you'd like to visit it, um, I'm always Earth. happy to, yeah, yeah, always happy to, often. no, no, it's, it was a different one, but it, it sort of fits um, the ideas nicely. And, yeah. you know, I, I just, for intrinsically motivating reasons, I want to help as many people as possible, uh, save years effectively in their life because they know themselves better and are spending less time that they ultimately regret, uh, which is a way of looking at um, time is wasted really. So um, that, that's really the goal. That's awesome. And uh, m- my goal with this podcast is to wrap up every episode with at least one tangible action item that the audience can take away and, yep. and implement to um start impacting the changes that they may want if, if they were if they were interested in everything that was discussed today which i'm sure they would be because it was a great conversation like Thanks. what would be what would be that one thing that you would suggest they start with that's going to start helping them live a more regret-free life and start saving those those important hours of life yeah the very first thing i'd recommend you start doing is tracking your time really Okay. Yeah. Do you have a, a um, suggested app or method of tra- tracking time? Uh, I, I do. So um, most people, I think these days, your listeners will have smartphones. Look, for, There are a lot of different solutions out there, primarily um, apps that are used for freelancers and you can track how much time you're spending on different projects. So you can ultimately get your billing correct. But if you use it for yourself and you define your categories of how it is you spend your time, who you spend your time with, that type of thing. Um, and you look for an option that has ideally a home screen widget. So, you know, you can switch states um, quite quickly. So I've, I've been tracking my time just for context since 2018, um, 24, seven, 365. Um, That's and crazy. so it's been, it's been almost two, two years now. Uh, and my attention actually for the better, for over a year since August of 2018, which is a little different than just our time, our behaviors. Yeah. Um, but that's going to do the attention economy thing. But uh, just the very act of tracking it, will make more of your decisions conscious yes. and you'll realize uh, a first of all you'll start spending it better just by doing that never mind anything deeper and b um, you'll start to see the opportunity that exists for you to identify what it is that you value to wait what it is that you value the the process i talked about earlier um, if you see a big discrepancy with how you'd like to spend your time and and how you are spending your time you know that's a it's, a it's a good motivator for change and uh it is entirely you know your choice and responsibility and power to do that and and you can do it so i i hope that people just start by start by not not turning the blind eye anymore just track how you spend your time yeah that makes sense and not you know, that we want tra- to promote it but what what is the app that you you currently are using 
Sure. So I'm on iOS and I use a trap called a tracker pro a tracker um, pro. Yeah. And okay. then one of the reasons I like it, obviously it's got a home screen widget, but it also uh, syncs to my calendar so I can have in my Google calendar, the history of how I've spent my time. Okay. Right. Yes. Uh, and uh, there was something else. Oh, it ties in nicely with Siri shortcuts too. If you want to use, you know, even faster. Yeah. Methods. Something I, I really want to explore more because I saw as soon as that launched in the last update, I was like, Oh, this is cool, but I've not spent enough time on it to, to learn it. In fact, I just want somebody to show me some cool shortcuts because yeah. <laughs> it's not that important to me. <laughs> no, no, it isn't. Oh, well, that's the thing. You start with what you want to do and why, and like you, you've got kind of this, this new direction. I know you've been super busy with, with fatherhood and, and yeah. uh, all this change. Um, but uh, the clearer you are on all of that, uh, that's when applying technology makes sense, right? Is yes. when uh, is yeah. to help you do what you inherently want better as yeah. opposed to technology being an end unto itself. Right. Using it as a tool leverage basically versus that, just. That's what it's supposed to be. Yeah. 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 Awesome. Thanks, Alan. Uh, so everything we talked about, any references we made, I'm going to include in uh, the description of the video or the show notes of the podcast. And uh, thank you so much. This was awesome. Um, and uh, I'm sure we're, I, if, if you're open to it, I'd love to have you back on uh, at a later date and we can dive into other stuff like the uh, tracking your attention. I think a lot of people would be really curious as to how you actually do that. Yeah, sure. Absolutely. Uh, it's been a pleasure. Thank you very much for having me. I look forward to, to chatting again. Awesome. Uh, Thanks for your date. And uh, yeah, take care, everyone. Take care. Thanks for listening to the Get Coach Podcast. If you're looking for more information, you can head over to our website, which is getcoachedpodcast.com. You'll find the show notes for this and every other episode there. And if getting actionable advice every week from professional coaches is something you want more of, then make sure to subscribe so you don't miss any future episodes.